Hey, good morning, everybody. So we're going to give it just another minute to see who else joins us, and then we'll get going shortly. Thanks for joining us. <clears throat> All right, guys, if you're just joining us, we're going to give it just another minute or so and see who else hops in and then we'll get started. All right, guys, so I'm going to go ahead and hop us off today. Um, we may have some other friends jumping, jumping in, and if so, we'll kind of go back over some of this. But so just want to start by saying thank you so much for joining us today here. You know, we love having these types of informational, educational calls at Royal Legal, um, but I really like specifically these investor persona calls because I think it gives a good chance to build our network for people who are in our same space. Um, so, you know, as Scott says a lot, the best way to build your net worth is to build your network. And so I really appreciate you guys showing up here today so we can make those connections, talk about some strategies and see how we can all further each other in our business endeavors. So to get started, if you've been familiar with these shows before, the typical format of what we'll do today is we're going to start off now with just this introduction and kind of the admin related type of um, information. After this, we're going to move into our breakout groups. And so inside of those breakout groups, there's going to be a couple of question prompts um, that we'll provide in just a moment. We'll also put in the chat for you. We'll do those breakout groups for about 10 minutes. And that, that time is really intended to be used for you to be able to connect with like-minded investors have any uh, introductory questions answered, that type of thing. After those breakout groups, we'll come back and we'll briefly recap what came out of that. Then we'll go into a presentation. Today, we're going to be talking about how the Series LLC is specifically tailored for the long-term type of investor. Um, and after that presentation, then we'll go back into breakout groups, talk about it with some like-minded investors again, come back and do a Q&A, and then we'll wrap it up for the day. So a couple things to note as we go through this, the session is being recorded, and I think that's really important for you to know, because if you see something in here you find really valuable, go ahead and flag it. Once you get this recording, pass it along to family and friends. Um, these recordings are publicly available and want to make sure we can reach as many folks as we can with information that can help them grow their business. Uh, next thing is we really love utilizing the chat. So if you have questions that come up as anyone is talking or any ideas or you want to throw out your contact information so people can reach out to you, the chat's a great way to do that. Um, we've got team members in here who will be monitoring it and also placing important links and information for you inside of it. If you want to speak verbally and we want to speak live, there is a reaction button down here on the bottom of your screen. If you'll hit that and raise your hand, we'll make sure your mic gets unmuted so we can hear what you have to say. Um, so let's go ahead and jump off this morning. And like I said, we're going to break out into those breakout groups. So there are about seven questions that we, we use as prompts inside of these breakout groups. It's going to be your name, location, what investments are you involved in? What's your superpower? Now, you can take that however you want. Some folks take it as their business superpower or their general superpower. Yesterday, we had a, a girl who told me her superpower was being a mom, and I absolutely understand that. 
Um, next thing is what's going well for you? What in your business could you share with someone else to potentially improve their experience? Are there any challenges you're facing that you can use help on or insight into? And then relatedly, who do you need to attract to make sure you're in the best position from a, a business standpoint at this time? So Ken has dropped those prompts in the chat as well, so you'll have them in front of them. And the other thing I want to try this week is, you know, when we come back from these breakout groups, we ask that you share kind of what it came out of it. And so I think if we can identify a spokesperson in each group who will just briefly give a synopsis of what came out of that group. So, you know, one to two minutes of what you heard, maybe some common challenges you're facing or particular topics, things you guys are wanting to learn about and connect about who you're looking for, that type of thing. Um, so if you'll identify a spokesperson in your breakout group, they'll come back just here, for, like I said, for just a short minute or two, and that would be great. So if everybody's ready for it, it feels good. Let's go ahead and hop into those breakout groups, Ken. All right, one moment. Thank you. Hey, everybody. All right. Well, welcome back. Um, so let's go ahead and hop into it. So if you were the spokesperson for your group, if you'll go ahead and hit that reaction button and we'll go through them one by one. All right, Constance, I see your hand there. So what came out of your group for you guys? <clears throat> oh, I think you might be muted there. Let's see. Sorry about that. No uh, so we started out with just the three of us and then um, Zahid joined us. So I'll go over what Gabe, Matthew and I shared and then I'll turn the mic over to um, to uh, Zahid. So Gabe is uh, Gabe Lopez. He's from Dallas, Fort uh, Worth, Texas area. He's investing in, <clears throat> he has a series LLC. He has one rental property. He's just starting. His superpower is intake of caffeine, uh, being organized. Okay detailed and he has spreadsheets that he uses for purchases so that is a superpower one thing that's going well his property is rented and they're paying regularly uh one thing that's a challenge or maybe going poorly is he wants to know how to keep momentum up for the next property mm. and what does he need to attract in his life to help um to help he's not really sure just do it or he's still in an information gathering state. And okay. of note is uh, me, Matthew, and Gabe are all first time joiners to this call. Oh. So moving right along to Matthew, um, he's a controller for a tech company in Dallas. He is in also in the Dallas Fort Worth area. He's investing in single family homes. His superpower is breaking projects into manageable pieces, organizing things to keep them moving forward. What's going well is his portfolio. He's able to scale and the overall portfolio um, is really doing well. So the management, he's doing a good job with managing that. Um, one thing that's a challenge is, you know, he has some vacancies or delinquent payments and he wants to understand and get more comfortable in giving people grace who might be struggling versus, mm -hmm. you know, when to file for eviction because they're just stringing it along. Yeah. And, um, to uh, attract in his life to help him. He's looking for like-minded individuals sharing ideas and applying those ideas to his own system um, and getting some biosis. So <clears throat> I'll carry on with myself. I'm Constance or Connie Finch. I'm in the Virginia City, Nevada area, although we just moved back to US after 10 years in Singapore. Uh, okay. So what am I... What am I investing in? Um, single or sorry, one to four, um, one to four units residential. Uh, my superpower is digital tax. So if you're doing online streaming of uh, videos or you have a, um, you know, software as a service or other digital products, uh, there is digital tax in 20 U.S. states in many countries. So contact me if you're interested in digital tax 
one thing that's going well is, first of all, we're so happy to be back in the U.S. It's like, thank you, God. <laughs> um, and we uh, just did a 1031 exchange out of a property near a, a raw land near Canada into a beautiful um, family home or, you know, multifamily home in uh, near, um, near Virginia City. And it's just beautiful. And I have great renters there. Uh, one thing that's a challenge is just getting settled back into life again after 10 years abroad. And so reestablishing those uh, systems, priorities, uh, habits, etc. And so what do I need to attract in my life to help me? I mean, it's wonderful to be on this call with like minded people. So that's pretty much the summary of what I heard uh, from Gabe and Matthew. And we did have one other person who joined us a little late. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Zahid Aziz. Go ahead, Zahid. That sounds great. And Constance, by the way, if you would you mind dropping your contact information if you're comfortable in the chat for anyone who wants to talk about digital tax? Oh, sure. I'm yeah. happy to do that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, Zahid, if you'd like to go ahead and share, uh, feel free to. If not, we can move on to the next group, whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, let's move on to the next group. I mean, I kind of came in late and you know, there's only 40 minutes left. I don't want to take too much time. Okay, yeah, no worries. Um, anybody else who spoke person for their group? I think we maybe had one or two other groups um, if you guys want to share. All right, yeah, Audra, go ahead. Hi, well, I didn't know it was a spokesperson until the end of it, so I'm going to go off memory here. Uh, so um, we, I had Brendan and Charlie in my group. Um, we got to chatting a little bit before, so I didn't really answer all the questions. Um, but Brendan specifically, so he is in Cali, and he invests in Cali with his wife long term, and they just recently started to invest in Florida to kind of diversify the areas that they have um, acquired. He just bought in Punta, Punta Gorta. I can't say that right. And um, he actually had something come up. One of um, one of I guess something that had come up with the property was that the the buyer's agent, the seller's agent, didn't really know much about the estoppel and. He had a, um, a tenant, unfortunately, pass away from COVID um, right after acquiring the property. And she had a 20-year-old um, son and his girlfriend living in the apartment that they were on the lease. So he's going through some of that um, right now, which I can imagine how, how that is. I don't know, Megan, if we have any tips or we can help him on that from our RLS perspective. Um, and that, yeah, he's trying to just, and he has a really good strategy. Like I loved one of his strategies that he said he and his wife do is that they kind of lower their price point, um, just a little bit to attract the right types of tenants so they can keep them for the long term, right? So long term investing and then long term relationships. I loved that, Brendan, for sure. Uh, Charlie, uh, we didn't really get to talk too much with Charlie. But um, he, I know he's in Hawaii because I, I watch all of these videos. And um, as well, he just happened to be, he used to be in the area that I'm looking to invest in too. So, and he actually, his superpower, it seems like he was in the entertainment business for a while. So we know why he's so extroverted and so, so much fun <laughs> to be around. Uh, but I didn't really get to, a chance to talk too much to him um, during, during the call. We were kind of just chatting in the beginning. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing, Audra. So, you know, a couple of common themes I'm hearing is that people are saying their um, their superpowers are going to be things that are more operational or more personality based. And I think both of those have a lot of merit when you're in this kind of world dealing with tenants and third parties and things like that. Um, so I think that sounds great. Well, guys, we'll, if anybody else wants to share from the last group, maybe we'll just condense and just share kind of any common themes that may have come up for you. And then we'll hop in the presentation. So if anybody else wants to share, give it another 30 seconds, throw up a hand and we'll we'll get that out there. All right, well guys, give me just a minute. I am going to share my screen and we are gonna hop right in the presentation then. Um, and like I said earlier, please be keeping an eye on the chat. If anything comes up during the presentation that you want answers to or wanna address, feel free to drop it and we'll, we'll tackle it on the back end. Me just a minute, guys. I apologize. I am not the most tech savvy. <clears throat> All 
All right, everybody, if you will give me a thumbs up, if you can see my screen, that would be great. Ah, fantastic. Okay, so let's hop into it, guys. I'm going to move this down a little bit. Uh, so like I said, today, we're going to be talking about the Series LLC for long-term investors specifically. And so this is going to be more geared towards folks who are outside of California. Um, if you are a California investor, there are going to be different considerations that we want to take, in, take into and um, play around with. So um, hit me up if that's something you are out, you're in California, um, have assets in California, you're a resident there, and then we'll talk about that separately. But so for today, we'll hop into it. Um, so who I am, so I think I know a good bit of you on the call, but a little bit of background, if not, if you're new. So my name is Megan Templeton. I am one of the consulting attorneys here at Royal Legal, have been with Royal Legal um, specifically for about three years, have been in the real estate, small business, entrepreneur world for much longer though. Uh, my investing career has looked like short-term, long-term rentals. Um, I've also been involved in syndications, note investing, and then also micro loans. Um, so a good bit of experience here, really passionate about this area. I think it is one of the best ways to build long-term sustainable wealth without having to um, hustle every day, honestly. Um, and then Royal Legal, you know, we do try to be your one-stop shop for investors. We operate in all 50 states, have been doing so for nine years. Um, and then I, be I believe this number is accurate, but I want to say we've helped protect over a billion assets at this point. And so we definitely have got a lot of experience and knowledge on our team and are happy to provide this information for you guys. So things that we want to be talking about and looking at inside of this is, as we're thinking about the Series LLC as a topic, why do we even need the Series LLC? Um, and it really is to protect you from those frivolous lawsuits. So things that are going to put you at risk for a frivolous lawsuit are having assets in your personal name. Um, if they can identify that you are the property owner, that is much more likely for you to have a lawsuit come against you at that point because it's easier for me to do them on the admin side. Next is going to be if you are solely relying on insurance and you're not, you don't have any type of structure in place. And so insurance can be a great resource, but it's definitely not the end all be all. And we'll talk a little bit about that more as we move on. Next is going to be lack of compartmentalization. So if you've got all of your assets into one bucket, you are putting them all at risk. And so the name of the game for us is to separate out that liability as much as we can. You also want to have anonymity. If you don't have anonymity in place, kind of like our first point, if people are able to look at the court records and easily find that you own that property, you're much higher risk for lawsuit than if you were able to put it into an anonymous structure. Next thing is going to be personal exposure to lawsuits. That also ties into the top point that if you've got things in your personal name, not only are your business assets, the properties and things you've purchased at risk, but it's also going to put all of your personal assets that you wouldn't consider at risk suddenly are involved in it. So that can be your personal residence, your vehicles, your personal accounts. Um, because you have attached yourself personally, everything that is attached to you as an individual becomes fair game for that attorney to try to capture to get the proceeds out of. So want to make sure we're getting things out of our name. Next thing is going to be too many LLC and bank accounts to keep track of. What that looks like operationally is if you have got a very scattered kind of um, multi-piece, multi-unit LLC structure, you're going to have a bunch of bank accounts and a bunch of bookkeeping. So there's a lot more opportunity for things to be done incorrectly, which can nullify the structure as a whole. So our goal is to streamline it so it makes it easy for you to maintain, easy for you to operate, and less opportunity for errors. So you'll see up here at the top, We've got this 3 million number as risk factors to lose. And that actually comes from a case study that came out of an RLS client where we had a client who had several of these items on this list she was working with. She had properties in her personal name, relying on insurance, things like that. And she got hit with a lawsuit. And it was a lawsuit that, uh, you know, she didn't believe was proper. She believed the litigant was not being completely truthful, but the court still found against her. And she had a $3 million loss because of it, where if she had put some of the strategies we use in place, we could have stopped that from happening. So hard learning experience on that one. All right. So this idea of is insurance is the last resort. What do we mean by that? So, you know, a lot of times when we first get folks in the door, they'll say, I'm not sure if I need a structure. I've got this really generous insurance policy. You know, the limits are really high. Um, I think I probably am going to be covered in the event something happens. Insurance is a great first resource. It's a first line of defense. 
What that you need to consider though, is that you are allowing a corporation to control how much protection you have. And they are a corporation. Their gain, their goal is to make money and to keep that money in house, right? So they can distribute it to themselves and their employees. So inside of that, they're not looking to pay out on premiums. Um, they will, they will for certain reasons, but they are actively trying to figure out how to pay as, out as little as possible. And so inside of that, I don't want to leave that type of authority and control of someone else. I want to make sure I've got a second line of defense so that my insurance is not my end all be all. So here's one of the things Scott likes to say a lot is that rich people do not own things. They don't pay taxes. So you may be saying, well, what does that mean, Megan? Um, that's always been the traditional American version of wealth is that you have a lot of assets. You've got the big mansion. Um, you've got the big bank accounts and they, and your tax returns will have the numbers to prove you're making it. Well, at the end of the day, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot with that kind of thing, because if you own a lot of things, then people are going to be able to take those things from you. And if you are paying a lot of taxes, then you're keeping that money out of your pocket. So the strategies that we use help to remove those assets from you while you remain in control, but they cannot be taken from you because you don't have true ownership. And it's also going to reduce your tax burden. Um, so you can keep more money in your pocket, continue to invest in your business and build that generational wealth. Lawsuits happen. You know, um, we thankfully do not hear about them too frequently with the structures we use because it stops them before they do occur. But I think one of the stats is if you are a real estate investor for, I think, 20 years, it says you've got a 92% chance of being litigated again. So it's not necessarily when, if you'll have a lawsuit, but when you're going to have that lawsuit. And inside of those lawsuits, it's not even necessarily about what's right and wrong. Honest people get sued every day, similar to our case study where we're talking about, you know, tenants are coming and they're looking for that payout. Now, oftentimes that can be proper, but sometimes you're going to have tenants who don't quite understand the complexity of the case they're bringing. And so we want to make sure that the strategies that we put in place and the, um, the tools we use are going to be bulletproof. So regardless of what that lawsuit is, how much merit it has, you're going to be protected from it. Lawsuits are a business. So the question is, uh, you know, a tenant will go to an attorney and they'll say, I've had this injury, I've had this problem come up, I want to litigate against, so I want my landlord to give me X amount of money. The next thing an attorney is going to do inside of that is they're going to look and they're saying, what's going to be the claim size? What is the potential recovery in this? How much money can we get out of this? Because that's going to impact the attorney fee. It's going to impact how much work goes into it. And they're going to be able to tell if that's a claim that's worth pursuing. But then the second half of that is what's the probability collecting? You know, if there's a claim size of a million dollars, but you found someone in the record, say that person owns $50 in assets, then that's not something you're going to be able to collect on. It's not worth the court fees administration side of it. So it'll deter a lot of attorneys. So that's where we come in. Um, now, we necessarily can't control claim size, but we can control that probability of collecting. And that's where we stand alongside you and make sure that we have got the strategies in place. So when the attorney looks at that case first glance, they're going to say this isn't worth it. So what do we use to do all of that? One of the best tools we have is the Series LLC. So let's talk about what that is. It's got a couple key features into it. It is something that is infinitely scalable for free. So a Series LLC structure is one that's set up where you can create as many of what we call child LLCs, child series LLCs underneath of it, and you only have one filing. So it's scalable. You can continue to create as many of those individual entities as you need, and you don't have to pay the additional state filing fees or state annual fees like you do if you work off of a hub and spoke model or a one by one LLC model. You can also utilize one bank account for it. So for the series LLC, you have one bank account in the name of the parent LLC, and you can run all transactions through it in conjunction with a clean bookkeeping system. So it's gonna streamline your operational pieces a good bit, which is gonna save you a lot of time, a lot of headache, and ultimately it's gonna be a lot easier for you to hand off if you ever bring in a third party person to work with. Next thing is gonna be, it's gonna be one set of accounting records. So like we talked about with that bookkeeping, it does go hand in hand with banking, but you can use one set of bookkeeping records. Um, a lot of our clients will use QuickBooks and just have separate tabs or one STESA account and that's then dictated out that way. There's a lot of ways to do it, but the important piece is you only have to deal with one. Next thing is because it is one entity to form and maintain, makes it a lot easier to get that entity right the first time. And then your maintenance time and costs are cut down significantly because you're not duplicating that process for multiple LLCs you get to do it once. Next thing, and I think this is the last, um, one of the more important pieces is that you can form it in any state and use it in any state. So one of the questions we get a lot is, well, you know, the series LLC is not available in my state. Is this an option for me? So we'll hop more into that in just a moment, but it is something where you can form it and use it nationwide. So it's infinitely scalable and it travels. 
So here's this idea of can the Texas Series LLC be pierced for a long-term investor? As a long-term investor, is this a safe strategy for me to use it? If I set it up, is it going to hold up? Um, and you'll hear a lot of people talk about in a little chatter online of, well, the Series LLC hasn't been well tested. That, that's correct. It hasn't been. But if they could have, they would have by now. Um, I think that is a testament to its strength, the fact that it has stood up. I mean, we're over 20 years in, and there was recently one lawsuit that came out about, I need to update the slide. But even that lawsuit, the courts found that the series LLC held up. So, you know, this is one of those structures you can say that about a lot of things that hasn't been tested, but I think we would view that as a strength because people are recognizing that it is set up well. So what allows it to be set up in one state and used in another? So for example, if we set up in Texas, like we frequently do at RLS, can you use it, for example, somewhere like Hawaii, where Charlie's at, um, or in you know, what Florida, where Brendan's at, one of these states where you're going to be investing in potentially. So because of the full faith and credit clause, you can use that series LLC in any state. So in the full faith and credit clause, that has been tested many, many times. Um, and it's always held up. That's what the constitution protects it is that you can set up these entities and use them elsewhere. So it allows the free flow of business throughout the nation. So it's not just, an, it's an LLC, but it's an LLC with a caveat. There's not really anything new for the courts to consider because it's really just a version of the old thing, but it's got this new improved step up of having the ability to create these child series along with it. There's a long history of these LLCs, things like Delaware Corps, um, where you can set them up one state, use it in the other. So the court precedent is there. So what I want you to take away from this slide is this is a structure you can feel secure in setting up and you're not gonna have issues with it down the road. Now, if anything were ever to come up, you absolutely would have our RLS team available to you, but we don't foresee any issues ever coming up and haven't seen any thus far. So as a long-term investor, you know, when, now we know that we can use it, but do we actually need to use a series LLC? That's the question I would come to next. And we kind of look at it as a threefold approach. So if you are an investor who is just thinking about getting into it, you don't have business activities yet, you don't own any assets yet, you don't have poor credit you're looking to improve or anything like that, you're not at a stage where you're probably going to need an LLC. Um, we can hold off at that point. If you're just dipping your toe into it and maybe you've got that one property and you know you want to grow, but you're not sure when that's going to be coming, you can operate more from a single traditional type of LLC model because you only have that one asset. So you're not going to have any compartmentalization things to think about yet. Um, but if you are someone who has multiple properties or is about to elevate your business um, purchasing and, and gain those assets quickly, let's go ahead and get the series LLC to set up for you. Um, what that's going to do is allow you to start correct from the jump. So if you are starting right from the jump, the start of it, you're not going to have to go back and retrofit anything. Retrofitting can cause things like additional costs, additional fees, and sometimes compliance problems. And so we like to get it right on the front end. I would say, depending on where you are in our journey, talk with our sales guys and they'll be able to direct to you. But I think if you're on the cusp of uh, ramping up your business with multiple properties, it's a good time to go ahead and do the series. So what does all this mean? Why are we looking at this? What is the bigger picture here? So I'm going to set up this series. I know I can use it. I know it's going to hold up. I know when I need it now, but why exactly do you need it? So what you're going to be looking to do inside of this, obviously, is you know you want to achieve the financial freedom. That's why you got into the investing game. Um, probably to have that passive type income where you can just sit in the background, you collect a check and you get to go to do the fun things like mountain climbing. Um, and so inside of that series is going to allow you to do that you're going to be able to get, regain some of your time because you're going to have just one set of bookkeeping records, one bank account, like I said, and the maintenance and operation of it's much simpler. It's going to protect your assets so that if anything ever does come up, you're not going to have the headache of worrying about it. And then it's also going to build your legacy because we've got ways we can build it in to pass that generational wealth down. So there's a couple of pillars that go into it. Uh, apologies. And so things that we're looking at is like, again, we're going to do the anonymity, the liability, separation, isolation, and then insurance. Those are the things we're going to utilize to make sure we've got everything in place. So where does a series LLC fit into a larger scope? So I know I need it. I need it to protect my assets, but how does it loop in with, you know, my retirement vehicles, my estate plan? What does a comprehensive action plan look like for you as a long-term investor? You know, we've got these listed here, things that can be utilized, so things like the estate plan to make sure all that wealth you work your, your life to collect, that you can pass it on to those that you love and dictate how that's done. 
If you have got a significant amount of um, assets now, you know, typically 20 million plus, and you want to reduce that tax liability, let's have a conversation about offshore trust. We're going to be using things like the living trust to do for that estate plan. Um, and then we're going to be using things like a traditional LLC for even more anonymity um, to run your operations through. And then we've got retirement vehicles like that solo 401k or the self-directed IRA. So this list lays out what a comprehensive plan looks like. Um, we are going to zero down into the series for today, but these are things you want to keep on your radar of as I'm growing, as I'm planning, how do I put these into my business? So on this one, like we talked about, what the goal is, is ultimate security. Protect your future, minimize risk, and I would also add a little bit of bandwidth to your business and life inside of this. These structures are going to help you give you time back, but also give you the peace of mind you need to enjoy that time. So what are the basics of the Series LLC? Uh, they can be formed in a couple different places. Like we hinted at earlier, they are not available in all 50 states to be formed, although they can be utilized there. But places you can set it up are going to be Delaware, Nevada, Texas, and Wyoming. Inside of that, the fees do vary a little bit. So you want to take a look at the fee structures for not only initial setup costs, but annual maintenance fees when you're figuring out where to set it up. All the charging order protections for it are pretty comparable. And so you may be saying, well, Megan, what is a charging order protection? What a charging order protection says is if they see you personally, they cannot get to your ownership interest in the LLC. If someone's able to attach themselves to your ownership interest in your LLC, well, then they've got all your assets. So we want to make sure that we are um, making we are creditors, debtors, no one can touch your ownership interest. And so all of the states you can set the series LLC in have the charting order of protection, not only in uh, statutory language, but it's also in court precedent when it's been challenged. So as far as the functional structure of the series LLC, you'll see this chart here on the right hand. If you're listening in, um, we'll make sure to throw up these slides as well for you. But so you've got the parent series LLC at the very top level. That is the entity that is filed and with the Secretary of State, the information that is listed in the uh, public paperwork. It'll have an operating agreement attached to it, things like that. But then underneath that series LLC, the way it is filed, it allows for us to cre create these individual child series LLC underneath of it um, with a couple pieces of paperwork that our team can put together for you. And then underneath that child series, you can put your assets. And so sometimes we'll use some type of a trust in conjunction with that, but those child series are where you're gonna put one asset per child series to get that compartmentalization. So this is the series LLC for the long-term investor. So what things we're gonna be thinking about is how do we create and maintain it with anonymity? We do that by making sure that an anonymous trust is actually the owner of your series LLC. So if someone were to pull up your series LLC paperwork with the Secretary of State, what they're gonna see is there's gonna be a trust listed as the member. And that's as far as they're gonna get because that trust document is actually an internally privately held document. Um, and inside of that document, it's going to say that you are the beneficiary of that trust, you're the trustee, so you still control and own everything inside of the LLC, but that information is not public. So you're going to have anonymity from the jump. Someone looks up your LLC, they're not going to be able to figure out that you own it. Um, inside of that, you're also going to have attorney-client privilege, and you're going to benefit from some of those things we were talking about earlier. So you get the one bank account, because it runs through the parent LLC, one bookkeeping records, Taxes are significantly easier. It's either one filing or it's, it just goes under personal return because it's passed through. And it's a scalable system because we can set up as many of these child series as we need to. So what does it look like when we pay taxes in this thing? So I mentioned that taxes are easy. So a couple different scenarios you got to run through. If you're single, then the taxes are treated as a disregarded entity and they go on your schedule C and E every return. And that C and E is going to be dependent on if you also have active income um, as well as passive income inside of your structure. If you're married in a community property state, same thing. If you're unmarried or you're married in a separate property state, then it's just going to be a, a matter of uh, the K-1s going to each partner and filing a single partnership return on behalf of the LLC. If you have questions whether you are in a separate property state or community property state, ask our attorneys. We can definitely walk you through that. So this diagram shows you a little bit more about how the taxes work, but I think it's also a great depiction of how the money flows. So step one is going to be those rental fees are going to come in. They're going to come in either to your traditional LLC if you're using one as an operating company or, um, you know, your third party property management company, whatever your tenant interaction structure is, rental fees will come into that then those rental fees will be distributed to the parent series LLC. 
And then from the Series LLC, that income can go to you individually as the owner. You take your distribution from that parent Series LLC. Um, and then at the end of the year, you're going to have that taxes. If you're unmarried, it'll be a partnership tax return where there are K-1 issues. If you are single or married, it's very similar setup. Income comes in to whoever your uh, property management structure is. That property management structure disperses the funds to the parent LLC. Parent LLC disperses the funds to the owners. Um, and then if you are married or single, then it goes on your personal tax return as a disregarded entity. So frequently asked questions we get about the um, long-term uh, investor when conjunction with the series LLC is what if I decide to get into short-term rentals as well or another type of active income? Can I hold active and passive in the same series LLC? So traditionally, we didn't think this was possible, but due to recent legislation changes um, and some guidance from the IRS, you can hold both passive and active inside of a series LLC. So this will streamline your business activities. You won't have to have two structures any longer. So inside of that, the way it gets reported functionally, like I mentioned earlier, it just goes on the C and the E, um, depending on how your CPA wants to divvy that up. Is your CPA going to understand what to do? Is this something they're going to need special software for? Do you need a special CPA for it? And the answer is no. Um, these series LLCs are set up so that from a tax perspective, they should be very easy to operate and maintain. So you should be able to use the CPA that you've been using for the last 20 years. Now, I do think a specialized real estate a CPA can be very useful for things like looking at tax deductions, claiming real estate professional, things like that. But as far as functionally just filing the series LLC return, any CPA should be able to do that for you and any accounting software should be able to track it. So the question is, if the series LLC is so great, why is everyone not using it? I think there's a couple of reasons that go into that. Um, most professionals are going to do what they've always done. So the traditional method had been the uh, traditional LLC or a hub and spoke model. So folks are just now getting used to changing their processes to the series LLC and when they use that. I think there's also a lot more education going on around this idea of using a series LLC. So they're going to become increasing more and more, more popular as we go. And so here at the end, you know, we've just got some um, reviews. So we've got a case study listed at the end of the slideshow for you to check out. So definitely check that out. See what other folks who work with RLS have said. This will be available for you after um, the video recording. And then here at the end, if you've got the presentation in front of you, we've got this quiz for you at the end. And so the quiz is the best way to connect with our team and let us know what your particular investment portfolio looks like. So we know how to get the right resources to you and to tailor your experience here at RLS. So if you haven't um, filled out that quiz, gotten connected with a team member yet, I highly recommend completing it so we can make sure we can give you the best um, resources we have to jumpstart your business. So. Guys, that's the things about the series LLC. So as you can see, there's a lot that's covered inside of that of why do we need it? When do we need it? How do I use it? How do I file my taxes for it? And really, what is the benefit overall? So hope that's some good information for you. Let's go ahead and do this now. Let's hop into our breakout groups, talk a little bit about what we learned inside of that. If anything new stuck out to you or any ideas how to incorporate into your business or any outstanding questions you may have. Because after we do breakout groups, we'll come back together. We'll do a q and I'm happy to tackle any questions you guys have around the series LLC. And we'll regroup and then we'll wrap up here uh, right at the 12 o'clock mark or 12 o'clock central mark. So, Ken, if we can go ahead and hop into breakout groups, that'd be great. All right. Thanks. All right, everybody. So welcome back. So does anybody want to share what came out of their breakout group form? Anything they learned or some things that they picked up on that might be good to implement for their business? Go ahead and hit that reaction button and we'll get you ready to go. Yeah, Brian, go ahead. Okay. We we um we just talked a little bit about the the uh, series LLC. I'm in California, so I have the Delaware Trust. Mm -hmm. Um and it's, but it's pretty, it's similar in some sense. Um, what are the questions? And we're all in the process of implementing it um, or along those roads. But um, one of the questions we had was like on mortgages. 
mm -hmm. um, from the, from being anonymous. Um, all the mortgages are still in like our personal name. So how does that like if someone's looking up for assets, how how does that get um, sort of enveloped in this whole you know picture? Yeah. So with mortgages, we use a couple things. One, we say that, you know, anybody can own a mortgage. You may be a note holder and you may not actually be the property owner. So we don't view it as a conclusive evidence of ownership. Um, there's also a couple ways of, you know, things like equity and stripping, which can be lent to that. So we don't ever take the name on the mortgage as definitive for ownership on the property records. There's not much we can do to get around with having it out there if the mortgage is in your name due to lending requirements, but it's something we can certainly, when we set up the series LLC and the way we put the information out for the land trust and things like that, we can make sure that the name on the mortgage is far enough removed from any of the documents that are directly related to the property other than the mortgage, that it's not going to be a concern. Does that make sense for you? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, anybody else want to share what came out of their groups? Or we can also just go ahead and open it up into q and I know we're running short on time here. So if anybody has any questions too, I'm happy to tackle those at this point. All right, well, I'll go ahead and answer. I know we've got two from Matthew here in the chat. Um, so, and Charlie, I'll, grab, I'll get to you in just a minute, my man. Um, so the first one of Matthew says, does the Texas Series LC need to be registered in the state where you're going to use it? So no, not if you were just using it purely as a holding company. So you can own property remotely without having to do an in-state registration of the property up and until the point you need to take an in-state action. So when you have to take an in-state action or would be quote unquote considered doing business in that state. So that's something where you need to use a court proceeding like an eviction, or if you're gonna have boots on the ground type of marketing, a brick and mortar location, then you have to do an in-state registration. But if you are purely just holding a property remotely, you don't have to register that Texas Series LLC anywhere else. Um, and then the follow-up question he had on that is, can a traditional LLC be converted to a Series LLC after it has been registered and created with Texas? It can. Um, it is a little bit of a it is a burdensome process and it can be costly. Um, and so what we actually recommend instead of converting the traditional to the series is let's empty that traditional LLC out. So strip it of its assets, move those assets into a newly created series LLC, take that existing traditional LLC you had, and then we're going to use it as an operating company. So it's going to remain a shell and it's going to be your public facing entity, but it's not going to have any assets attached to it. So I don't really recommend the conversion method as much as we create the series and use that existing structure in conjunction with it in a new way. Um, and then let's see, we've got one more it's, uh, from Brennan. It says refinancing Fannie Freddie lenders spoken with want you to move the property out of the land trust into individual names during the refi move it back afterwards and that's exactly right so what we told folks is anytime you have a financing event so if that's going to be a refi getting a HELOC um, adding someone to your loan any any type of thing that's going to cause the lender to look at that loan again let's go ahead and move the property out of the land trust complete that financing event and then move it in back after um, because the lenders do get a little sensitive about trying to work inside of a land trust, so it's much easier and time and cost effective to remove it, complete the financing event, and then move it back afterwards. And Charlie, go ahead, bud. What was your question for me? Well, I think you answered one of the questions um, that I was just going to ask regarding the, the movement of the, uh, the uh, property, because uh, we have some properties that are going through some of that right now as mm -hmm. well, um, and that's kind of what we're, we've uh, worked out uh, with the, between the lenders and ourselves mm -hmm. um, before we put back in, put it back into the, the land trust and the structure. Yeah. So I have Perfect. to take it out, do it personally and go back in there again. But um, one of the conversations we had um, in our work group was, you know, we have on one side, um, for, for example, Brandon has a, has a DST and on my side, you know, we're looking at setting up a series LLC and a consideration of a DST as mm -hmm. well. You know, as far as the structure, but because I have multiple uh, companies and businesses other than just real estate, uh, but so I think it's a really effective plan. But I also have business in California too. Okay. You know, so the question was which one is more effective. So we're we're already in discussions with you folks on, on all that structure, but yeah. the the thing that we did come to consensus on um, when we were looking at you know which which is better was. The reality was in discussions in the past with our CPA or past CPAs, I was sharing with Brendan that um, when I talk with my professionals, 
the, the CPA and or my business attorney, they all were, they themselves were com compartmentalized to the point where they didn't really tie everything together. So what I, what I wanted to mention was uh, Royal Legal, for those who are, are watching for the first time, um, you guys, Royal Legal is a very effective uh, picture because you guys bring it all together, wrap it all together. Um, so you get, you understand the taxation, the business structure, you know, um, your real estate and, and general business all together in one. So you know how to, and how to work it through different states. And that's something that was very complicated for me. I've having to been, have been in business for over 30 years and already having the pieces, all the multiple LLCs, but not really realizing how do I need to take those pieces and place them into this, this structure now that can help support me in all these different pieces. Because every time I ask that professional for help, they would say, oh yeah, put it into one structure and so you can save all the money there. You know, that would be the CPA and I'm saying, okay, how do I do that? And they're like, uh, well, you gotta go talk to your attorney about that. We don't do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, so for, for those who are trying to figure this out, that's, I think that's where they need to understand um, the value of, of you folks at Royal Legal in helping to put those pieces together and helping us to understand and see all these pieces. So uh, whether you're a seasoned business person or you're brand new to real estate investing or business in general, um, this is an excellent you know, venue for, for people to learn and, and see. So I just wanted to mention that because uh, he and I both had the consensus about the value of what R R RLS does, yeah? And how you folks help bring it together. So anyway. Well, thank you, Charlie. Just a little I bit really of yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that, Charlie. I really appreciate, um, you know, you, you come to all of our shows and always have great insight. And I think you hit the nail on the head is we at Royal Legal, Royal Legal do try to be that one-stop shop and have um, educational resources, educated staff, and then also shows like this related to the various parts of all of this and how it comes together. So how does the tax interact with the business operations, with the business uh, entity, liability, protection structures, things like that. So we do try to really put it all in together. Um, and so I really appreciate you flagging that, Charlie. And so related to that, I do want to highlight that we do have all of these different shows. So we do at least one show, if not two, almost every day of the week. Um, we've got a content calendar you can check out that'll uh, list all the shows we have. We have these investor-specific profiles based on what you are um, your, your investor profile is versus, you know, long-term, short-term diversified. We've also got tax shows, Royal Life, which is a general business show. And I see that Ken is actually dropping some links in the chat related to those. So highly recommend checking out those shows. It's a great way to figure out again, how everything does pull together. Um, and then a new resource we're going to be rolling out are these things called discord channels. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. Um, they're relatively new to me, but it, Essentially, it's a chat venue, so we, we can make sure that the networking and um, interactions both with Royal Legal staff and all the Royal Legal members can continue inside of those chat rooms, even when these calls are not going on. Uh, it makes it easier for you to guys to connect. So I also see that Ken's going to be dropping those Discord channels for you. They'll be in the emails as well. Highly recommend that you get signed up for those. I've got it on my phone, so I get an alert some, when somebody posts. Um, that way I can make sure I get that interaction if it's something that piques my interest or I've got some experience in. So please check out all the resources we've got for you guys. Um, I, we are about seven minutes over, so I'm going to leave it open now in case you have any other questions. I'm happy to tackle them for you. I've got a few more minutes. Or if you need to hop off, you got something going on. I know we've had some folks who had uh, meetings to run to. Feel free to do that. But thank you guys so, so much for joining us today. Check out the other resources we've got. This Tuesday meeting will always be geared towards long-term investors. So you can always uh, tune in on Tuesdays at this time. It's 11 central. We'll have different topics each week. We'll be walking through some products you can use. We'll eventually get to having um, some guest speakers who will talk about their experience in the space, market um, updates, things like that. But so for a long-term investor, I think this is the best place for you to be. Get all the information you need. Network with people who are in the same area as you. So check those out. And if anybody's got questions, I'm happy to tackle them now. Hey, Ray. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Megan. Uh, so quick question. When opening banks accounts, uh, I think one impediment I have had is that I live, so I reside from like, I live in Boston, but also reside in New York, right? And mm -hmm. my traditional LLC, it's the home base is Texas, right? But I, I'm doing business in Philly. So sometimes I, I have like a hard time, uh, like, 
describing my business right to the banker to like to open the bit bu- like business accounts so yeah. like f- moving forward how will you go and approach the banker if you want to open a business account with your traditional llc yeah so i think there's a couple of parts that go into this one is you need to identify the right bank to be going to um, most of the time what we tell people is any nationally chartered bank is going to be able to set up and accommodate the types of accounts you're going to need for the structures we use so i would recommend a nationally chartered bank sometimes you can work with local banks work with credit unions they're just not always as familiar with what we're doing But when you do identify that bank and you're walking in to set up that account initially, things I would take with you would be the operating agreement for your LLC, the formation paperwork, that's the paperwork that'll come back from the Secretary of State. And then inside of that, you're also going to need the trust agreement, because since your information is not directly on that formation paperwork, it's going to list the trust name, they're going to have to look to the trust document to see exactly who um, has authority. So trust agreement, formation paperwork, operating agreement. And then once they've had a chance to review that, and EIN as well, um, and once they've had a chance to look at that, if they have any outstanding questions, which typically they don't, but if they do, let our team know and we can walk through those individually with you. I talk with bankers all the time about this kind of stuff when getting accounts open, so happy to facilitate that. We've got the team to do it, but that should be the basis of what you'll need when you walk in. Awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, Chris, what about you, bud? Hey, um, Apologize for being late to this meeting. I uh, just had to mix up with my calendar, but, and so this might've been answered earlier. Uh, so I, again, I apologize. Um, but in terms of, I, I've noticed that a number of states require you to list or uh, the trustee uh, when you mm-hmm. title a property. Yeah. You guys, uh, is there a way to, I mean, obviously if we're doing it for anonymity, it's going to be a waste if I'm the trustee on that. So yeah. I take care of it. Is it one of you guys or is Scott the trustee or, or how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. And then you hit the nail on the head. Scott's the trustee. Um, So when we create those land trust agreements and the land trust name, what eventually goes on the deed um, inside of our trust agreements, we make sure where we list it, where, uh, you know, Scott, one of our staff members, somebody is what we call the nominee trustee for you. And so that's what name is going to be on the deed. They're not going to be able to trace it back to you unless they get the trust document, because it does state later on what happens when Scott's no longer the trustee, what the triggering event is for him to fall off and you become the trustee. But as long as they don't get a hold of the trust document, no one's going to know. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, how about, uh, you know, we were talking about mortgages uh, and having to switch it back to personal name and mm-hmm. such. Uh, obviously, if I'm going to be signing the mortgage and that's a public document, that's mm-hmm ruin the anonymity as well uh, do you have any workarounds for that yeah this, we had kind of touched on this a little bit earlier so it's kind of a tricky situation that there's not really a good way to get around not having your name on the mortgage document at all right it's a lending requirement um, but what we tell folks inside of that is being on a mortgage document does not necessarily indicate ownership anyone can hold that note um, so we that's the first line of defense is just saying the mortgage is not definitive for ownership because when they take that mortgage document and compare it with the deed they're not going to match um, and second dearly in that there are things we can do like equity stripping to throw it off even more so um, so there are tools we can put in place we kind of individualize those for your structure but ultimately we can't avoid having your name most likely on the mortgage but we have ways to get around it proving ownership if that makes sense okay um have you noticed something I will some states allow you to have like an additional llc or an additional trust be the trustee <laughs> Some do, and, and and there's also that comes into um, a county requirements and stuff. So there are some of them will. It is not a blanket default rule, though. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I just want to make a comment too that having an attorney as the trustee on title is also another level of deterrence that I, I kind of like to see as well. I mean, if you're not going to want to sue somebody if you think that the owner might be an attorney. So right. uh, that is a plus. Yeah. Well, thanks for pointing that out. I think that's a great point too. And then we've heard that feedback before of, you know, just having that Esquire behind the back of the name can be a deterrent in and of itself. Um, and Chris, I saw where you mentioned where can you get the content calendar. So Ken, if you'll drop that content calendar link in the chat, that'd be a good resource for folks as well. Um, and guys, and then I'm going to tackle this last question from Matthew. If you do have any others, hop them in, drop them in the chat. I'll try to tackle them, but I do want to make sure I get everybody out of here in quick order. Um, so next one is follow up about converting to a series LLC. So Matthew, if you want to drop that, if you want to drop that in the chat or ask now, happy to do it. Or you can shoot me an email if it's something that's more sensitive. Um, either way, you want can, to do it. can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay. Hey, thanks um, for the time. I just, um, so for, um, uh, for purposes of working with a specific lender, right, they require an LLC. And if I went the route of, of setting one up on my own, but haven't actually used it yet, mm -hmm. so I don't actually own the property, and can I still convert it? And if so, that's what I'm wondering, like, is it time consuming and expensive if I've got assets that need to be converted, or if it's essentially still a shell, and I have yet to close? Is that a relatively simpler process to just make it uh, a, a series LLC? Or is it still too late? Or is it, is, it you know, uh, not too late, but yeah, now I go try. It's it is if it doesn't have assets and it's truly a shell, it is more simple than if it did have assets, but it's still complicated because the conversion process really what it gets into is the filing with the state is not simplified. You've got to do a lot of <clears throat> documentation. Um, and so and the filings can be expensive. And then if you have any, like if you've been using it as a shell, but using it for contract purposes, you've got to go back and reassign contracts and things like that. So it's still a complicated and can be costly process, but it's not so as much so as if you had assets in it. All right, Matthew, any follow-up questions on that or does that, that work for you? Um, yeah, I guess I'd like to get more information about what that looks like. I don't, this may not be the right forum, right? Should I just book time with with Alia, or how would I? How would you suggest I proceed to get yes. a little bit more info on that? Yeah, I would. If you've been working with Olia um, or any of our attorneys, go ahead and shoot them an email and hop on one of those uh, calls. They'll be able to walk through it for you for your circumstances. Okay, thanks, Megan, and thank you for all the help. I know you and I've worked together over the past few years, and 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 I echo the comments. Royal Legal is a great service, and. Um, you guys have always taken care of me and um, it, it's added a lot of value to my process and enabled me to scale. So thank you so much for all of your help and support. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate the feedback. Uh, and it's been a pleasure working with you. So yeah, hit us up. We'll talk about the conversion a little bit more. Um, I did just see that Ken said the February content calendar is not quite available yet. As soon as it is, though, we'll get that out to you guys. Um, and then I'll take this last question from Zahid and then we'll log it off for the day. Go ahead, Zahid. How's it going? I, you know, I'm in California. I have the DST. Um, and just quick question, but it's kind of unique. Kind of on the same note that the guy, the the other question, the previous question. If I'm trying to buy a property in Ohio, mm -hmm. a multifamily, and I have spoke to Royal Legal, you know, buying it straight into a DST. But if I have a person in Ohio that has five percent ownership in it. Is DST still the same, you know, a good structure for that? Or should I do, um, you know, something else? Yeah, no, DST is still a good fit for that. So you can use your DST for any properties you've got ownership interest in. Um, when you do have an outside partner that's going to have an ownership interest, they can invest and become part of your child series or you invest in the LLC, the properties. And there's a couple of ways to do it that are specialized depending on the deal itself. But for you and how you're investing your portion, the DST is a great fit. Okay, so just have them uh, as part of the child, a 5% ownership inside the child, the DSC. Okay. Yep, that's right. exactly right. And so what will happen for tax purposes is you'll issue that partner a K-1. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and call it today. But if you found this valuable, you want to go back and rewatch it or share it with friends, we will have the link available later today. And then in about 45 minutes or so, we'll have the royal tax call. So if that's something you're interested in, I highly recommend um, Hop into that one. Myself and Pete will be talking about how to use your net losses to offset a couple different items, actually. So I think it'll be a good call. But hope everyone has a great day. Thanks for joining and hoping to see you next Tuesday. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Meg.